Hello and welcome to another episode of CNBC's Beyond the Valley. I'm Arjun Karpal here in London. There's a bit of a, a different look and feel about today's episode because we are in uh, CNBC's London headquarters at the moment. So you've got the newsroom here, a uh, little bit of buzz, a little bit of action uh, around us uh, today for a very action-packed topic, and that is stable coins or, or not so stable coins. What are they, how do they work, and why are they the backbone of the cryptocurrency industry? We're going to be talking about all of those things today, including one particular type of stablecoin that ended up collapsing and what that eventually means for the future of the industry. I'm very pleased to tell you I'm joined today by uh, CNBC correspondent Ryan Brown, who's been covering this topic extensively. Uh, Ryan, thanks so much for joining me today. Great to have you here. Thanks for having me, Arjun. So stablecoins, it's a type of cryptocurrency, uh, but, but what exactly are they? How do they work? Sure, so stable coins are a type of cryptocurrency, but they are normally uh, backed by an existing asset. So say the US dollar or even gold, you know, kind of traditional assets in, in the real financial world that aren't other tokens. And the whole point of this is to maintain a stable value. So things like the US dollar, things like gold, these are seen as much safer assets that you would want to have your money in versus a cryptocurrency like Bitcoin, which as we know can you know vary in value by about 20% some days. So they're just seen as much more kind of stable, less volatile than traditional uh, cryptocurrencies. And that's why people are putting their money in them. So effectively, those that are issuing these, these stable coins have some sort of reserves that, that back the, the value of this, this stable coin that, that most of the time, right, is, is pegged or try to be pegged to another currency, i.e. Uh, in many cases, it's trying to be pegged one to one with the US dollar. And, and they use these reserves effectively to back that. So, I mean, if we take that concept, why are they important for the world of, of cryptocurrencies? What are they used for? I mean, how do they differ from when we talk about things like Bitcoin? I mean, the importance of stable coins really is the fact that traders can use them to just trade in and out of other cryptocurrencies like Bitcoin, like Ethereum, uh lightning fast, you know, versus the traditional banking world where, you know, it can often take a, a day or two to sort of settle uh, financial transactions. With stable coins, these are on the, the crypto rails, so to speak. So, you know, um, they will be settled kind of in these peer-to-peer -peer transactions. Um, but the key thing about stable coins is that um, they are, as you know, it said on the tin, they're supposed to be stable, they're supposed to be backed one to one by dollars. So if you do see your crypto holding suddenly fluctuating wildly in value, uh, particularly if it's going down, you might suddenly decide, oh, actually, I've, I've had enough of that now. I, I'd quite like to get my money out of Bitcoin, which is you know tumbling 10% or whatever, and put it into a stable coin like Tether or USD coin. Now, we know there's different types of stable coins, and that's the key. I've heard this phrase so many times. Not all stable coins are created equal from the industry in the past few weeks because of a lot of problems that have been happening. So we've got, on the one hand, that traditional stable coin, I guess, in which we'd put things like Tether uh, and USD coin. And then you've got these so-called algorithmic stable coins. Just help us understand the difference between the two. Sure. So. Tether is one of these asset-backed uh, stable coins. And what that essentially means is that Tether is supposed to have a pile of assets, you know, preferably cash, but sometimes, as we've kind of learned recently, actually Tether doesn't have a full amount of its holdings in cash. Actually, some of that is kind of reserved by other assets, such as US Treasury bills, uh, commercial paper, and other things that are kind of like cash, but not exactly the, the, the exact same as cash. And there'll be some problems that we'll explore a bit later that, that arise from that. But um, that's essentially the idea, you know, just the, the fact that you would have enough assets in your reserves in case investors suddenly get cold feet and decide, well, I don't want to have my money with Tether anymore. Um, I don't have the full confidence in Tether. And so therefore, if I take my money out, I should expect to get you know, the equivalent amount in US dollars back um, like for like. With algorithmic stable coins, on the other hand, what they try to do is get around the entire problem of having a bunch of dollars in reserves, because that's a hassle. You know, you have to, you have to be an asset manager, essentially. In Terra USD's case, this is an algorithmic stable coin, what they tried to do was to have an algorithm, a sort of you know mechanism, uh, a, a code uh, that would you know kind of govern the the value of that stable coin and try to keep it as close to a dollar all the time. Now 
as we've obviously seen uh, in recent days, that's not been the case, and, and you've had the, the value of Terra USD completely sort of come down to, to essentially zero. Yeah, so effectively, Terra USD lost that peg that it was supposed to have with the dollar, and that of course caused the collapse of, of this sort of sister token, Luna. Talk, talk to me about Tether though as well, because this is a, a particular stable coin that's sort of generated a lot of controversy, particularly because of the reserves that it holds. Yes, it's got uh, some cash, yes, it's got some government bonds, but it also had sort of commercial paper or, or uh, company debt effectively. But the issue was around transparency, right? That's right. So Tether, uh, many years ago, uh, got into some trouble with the New York Attorney General. And what the New York Attorney General said was that at all times, Tether claimed to be backed one to one by dollars held in a bank. But actually, um, as we've kind of learned uh, over the years, that was not the case. Um, Tether has kind of been accused of lying. Um, it's been accused of not being completely honest about the kind of assets that do underlie that. So what the New York Attorney General and Tether did in uh, a couple of years ago was they came to a settlement where Tether and Bitfinex, an associated company, a crypto exchange, they were both accused of sort of commingling client funds, essentially, you know, using some profits from one company to sort of account for losses potentially in the others. Now, this is all kind of still alleged Tether doesn't admit any wrongdoing here, but but essentially what came out of that was the, the guarantee from Tether that they would issue quarterly updates, you know, attestations, basically breaking down what exactly it is that is in Tether's basket of reserves. And what we found out as a consequence of that is that they didn't always have cash in their uh, reserves. They had other things. Uh, and commercial paper was uh, a key one that sort of generated concern because the commercial paper market, you know, it's, it's obviously supposed to be a little bit like cash, but it's not exactly as liquid. You know, if you suddenly had people, you know, fleeing en masse, um, the likelihood of being able to sell commercial paper when you don't know exactly the quality of that commercial paper, it's not incredibly transparent. It's not clear that Tether would be able to meet all those, those redemptions at once. And so uh, they have said uh, that they will look to reduce the amount of commercial paper as well, given, given the concerns over, over what you've brought up. When we talk about, I guess, uh, UST then, or, or Terra USD, uh, as it's also known, uh, you know, what was the specific issue there? Um, because, as you mentioned, it works on an algorithm, uh, quite a complex one at that, that involves a, uh, an interplay between the Terra USD stablecoin token and this Luna token uh, as well, which which was sort of an associated or sister token to that. So, what exactly happened there when sort of Terra USD began to lose its peg and the knock-on effects? Yeah, so it's obviously incredibly complicated, and as we've kind of seen elsewhere in you know just the tech world more broadly, but just specifically within crypto and DeFi, is there's a constant kind of theme going on here where this code is generated by humans, and ultimately humans you know can fail, and that will come up you know every so often in the crypto world where you have this complete meltdown in an asset, and what is current kind of behind it is vulnerabilities in that code. It's not perfect. So what happened in, in UST's case was they had a mechanism where they tried to hold uh, as close to a dollar as possible by linking that to an associated token called Luna. Now, Luna was a, a floating token. You could trade it on the open market. Um, it had its own kind of value that was you know, not necessarily tied to UST. But there was a, a mechanism here where people were incentivized to exploit what's known as arbitrage opportunities, essentially deviations in the price of UST. If UST was to fall below a dollar, for instance, traders would be incentivized to kind of buy up that UST at that lower price and then trade it in for sort of Luna because you'd get the equivalent amount um, Luna sort of like for like to UST. So you'd be able to pocket the difference from that. And also because you're selling the UST, that in theory, kind of takes that UST out of the supply, um, thereby kind of, you know, in theory, boosting the, the, the price back up to a dollar. That was the kind of rule that was in place. That's what they tried to achieve. But as we saw with crypto prices suddenly uh, going completely down this, this year, I mean, the, there was all sorts of questions around the sustainability of that model. As you had all that selling pressure, as investors kind of fleed this thing uh, en masse, ultimately it just wasn't able to kind of you know sustain itself under that pressure. Yeah, those 2022 market crashes really tested the business model of, of so many different projects in the cryptocurrency space. Um, when we talk about stable coins like Tether and others sort of being the backbone 
of of cryptocurrencies. Um, just explain to us very briefly why that is the case. But secondly, given that is the case, if there are problems with these coins, does this pose any kind of one systemic risk to the broader industry? But two, how much of a systemic risk at this point is it spilling into other areas of financial markets as well? Just on the first question about you know why stable coins are so kind of uh, significant for the crypto economy, I mean. These are essentially, you know, sort of like um, the, the things that keep the wheels in motion, you know, because uh, it's not easy to convert uh, fiat currency into crypto. You have to kind of load a bunch of dollars into an exchange, wait for that to kind of process and, and settle. And these crypto exchanges often don't have kind of you know, traditional banking relationships, so that complicates things even further. Now, with stable coins, they're outside the regulatory parameters. People can access them um, easily and use them to sort of trade in and out of cryptocurrencies. And right now, um, the, the main way to kind of get involved in, in crypto and trade crypto is via these stable coins. Now, why that has such a, a huge implication for cryptocurrencies if uh, some of the confidence in those stable coins is suddenly waning is because, you know, such a huge amount of trade um, in crypto is done with stable coins. So if you suddenly find out that actually those stable coins don't have the, the sort of value that they're purported to, to have, then all of a sudden the, the entire thing is, is in question and in, in doubt. So. So that's the, the issue here. So when we talk about sort of systemic risk in crypto, you know, if, if we got to a point where, where something like a Tether or USD, you know, these larger, much larger stable coins do begin to lose their peg, that could really have a ripple effect, couldn't it, across the crypto economy? Definitely. It's the thing that people have feared for, you know, years and years in this space is what happens if Tether was to collapse, you know? I mean, it's kind of been a play that's been active in the market, you know, for, for a long time. Uh, there's always been kind of questions bubbling in the background about whether Tether actually does have enough dollars to, to you know, sufficiently back its US dollar peg. But if we were to kind of see Tether collapse, that would really be, you know, a, a huge, uh, have a huge impact for, for the market because like we've discussed, you know, it, it, it is kind of such an active player in the market. It's, you know, a $60 billion juggernaut. It's the biggest stable coin that, that's out there. And there's, there's a lot of kind of riding on Tether being honest and, and actually uh, delivering on its kind of promise of, of being backed one-to-one -one by dollars. If we find out that it isn't, then of course that there would be huge sort of questions about what that means for crypto. It's also interesting to think about the systemic risk for broader financial markets as well, because we know that there's a lot of retail participants in the cryptocurrency markets. And I think, uh, you know, one of the things we have seen indeed is, is the fact that uh, cryptocurrency has been quite heavily correlated to uh, high risk assets like technology, growth stocks, um, some of these meme stocks as well. And, you know, if you have investors who have a portfolio full of a lot of this stuff and the market's on its way down, you know, if they're looking to sell, it may be that they're looking to sell crypto, but also then sort of dumping some of their other high growth assets in other financial markets. Well, I think that's what's really fascinating about this particular cycle. That brings us on, I think, nicely into the topic of regulation, because while we're talking about stable coins in 2022, it's not necessarily a new topic as such. Uh, you know, Facebook, uh, a few years back came out with this idea of, of Libra, which then got rebranded to Diem. This was a, a stable coin they proposed to be backed by some real world assets um, as well. But of course, there was so much controversy about it because it was Facebook. There were questions about Facebook's track record when it came to privacy, the fact that such a powerful company, should they be in control of this, this level of money? What kind of threat would it pose to, to existing currencies? When you think about you know, 2018 and 19 and, and now into 2022, what are the, the sort of evolution of how the regulators are thinking? What are they concerned about now? How has some of their thinking changed on stable coins versus a few years back? Well, you're definitely right. This isn't a new conversation, you know, uh, back, God, when was it? 2019, when Facebook sort of introduced uh, Libra, as it was known, changed to DM. Now the whole thing's dead, of course. Um, 
It's just funny you kind of mentioned Facebook. I mean, obviously, they've long been the sort of punching bag of, of the tech industry generally. But there was serious concerns, not just about Facebook, but the fact that this was, you know, a private digital currency. You know, this is something that is being invented in the private sector outside of the control of governments. And the implications of that are huge because, you know, this is a company that could dictate its own kind of monetary system, you know, uh, where you have this private money where, where people are getting out of their, their um, dollars or euros or pounds and they're, they're putting that into the Facebook kind of reserve or, or any kind of stable coin reserve. And the implications of that are huge because, well, a company like Facebook, especially, this is, you know, used by billions of, of people around the world and creating that sort of separate economy outside the kind of traditional financial world. Um, I mean, that could just have huge kind of uh, effects. But that definitely kind of stirred the debate initially um, because there were, the, the main concern was about does this threaten the you know significance of sovereign currencies? Obviously, central banks want to protect that. They want to have the kind of confidence of the public that that we are the the institutions that you can trust. And so, what you had was a huge backlash against Libra to such an extent that eventually the entire project did kind of fall, and it didn't sort of it wasn't successful. Um, they tried to uh, launch this thing um, with a, a partner called Silvergate as a kind of regulated product, but ultimately it just didn't come to fruition. Um, now, as a consequence of that, you're seeing these concerns bubble over with different stable coins. You know, in the EU, they've recently agreed this landmark piece of legislation called Mika, uh, aptly named uh, Markets in Crypto Assets, uh, just rolls off the tongue. Um, but what this essentially means is, you know, it's a comprehensive um, framework, the first of its kind um, uh, globally, um, that there's not really anything of this kind uh, yet in any kind of main, you know, mainstream uh, countries, mainstream markets. So what that means is, is they're going to effectively, you know, introduce curbs for, for stable coins, um, and obviously the conversation around Terra USD has just really raised the impetus to, to get something like this done because we don't want to see um, stable coins threatening the economy. Certainly, regulators don't don't want to see that. So, so just I mean, help us run through what you're seeing in jurisdictions around the world because you know one feature of regulation in in cryptocurrency, wherever there is regulation, that is, is um, a discrepancy across countries, a very fragmented uh, nature of, of uh, cryptocurrency regulation. You've got jurisdictions like Singapore and the UAE so open uh, and actively trying to promote uh, crypto businesses and bring them over and help them set up in those countries. Uh, there are others, of course, we know very well China has effectively blocked most things to do with cryptocurrency. Uh, and there are others that sort of sit on the fence uh, in the middle somewhere, like the US and even the UK as well. So when it comes to stable coins specifically, what are you seeing kind of globally? What are some of the key uh, countries or regions we should be looking at who are passing regulation, talking about regulation, uh, and sort of trying to act on it? So, I mean, it's, it's a great point because um, what you're seeing at the moment is just complete fragmentation across different countries when it comes to crypto. In the US, uh, President Biden has signed an executive order where he's calling for um, federal coordination, you know, just figuring out how to kind of actually get your act together and regulate crypto. And Janet Yellen, the Treasury Secretary, has been very vocal about the need to get some kind of regulation in place on stable coins. Obviously, added impetus for that given the kind of crisis with US in the UK, you've got the government saying that they would, um, they are going to bring in regulation. They're going to bring in um, regulation where these stable coins are actually regulated payment institutions um, under kind of some existing existing fintech rules that govern companies such as uh, Revolut and, and Wise and others. So you will have those stable coin providers brought into the regulatory parameter. Um, in the EU, you're you're seeing um, a huge kind of set of landmark reforms where they are going to have a, a sort of complete um, update of, of the, the legislation to cover new crypto companies and stable coins. Um, but you're right. I mean, it's not entirely clear what this regulation is going to look like. The, this stuff takes a long time to put into place. Um, that's the one thing that I've kind of heard from uh, in the crypto industry is frustrations with getting everybody on the same page because um, it does uh, have huge implications. You can't kind of have the confidence that you can set up shop in, in a certain jurisdiction um, 
you're not going to do it, are you? Unless you've got that sort of confidence that you're not going to get a, a sort of slap on the wrist from, from the regulator if you do fall foul of those laws. Absolutely. I think that's a good place to, to leave it, Ryan, as well, because we are going to be watching intensely, I think, how the regulation develops. Uh, I feel like the, the Terry USD debacle that's happened has really sort of been a, a wake up call to some extent for regulators around the world on what they're going to do. Uh, perhaps we will begin to see some tighter regulation on this on stablecoins specifically, but more broadly on the crypto market. But we know that regulators are still trying to uh, figure that out. But it feels to some extent that the, uh, the future of stablecoin hangs in the balance. Uh, Ryan, thanks so much for joining today. Thank you very much. Get involved uh, in the discussion here. Uh, leave us a comment if you're watching on YouTube. You can also reach out to us on Twitter. Ryan, what's your handle? Ryan underscore Brown underscore. Uh, and I'm on at Arjun Karpal. That's it for another episode of CNBC's Beyond the Valley. Thanks for listening and watching, and we'll catch you next time. Beyond the Valley.